So um, I, I also want to thank very much uh, the organizing uh, team for having me here today. It's, uh, it's wonderful. Um, I uh, actually contributed to the book that Jacqueline uh, just presented, and uh, when I agreed to write something for the book, I actually understood uh, a different title. So when I received this art copy of this book, I said, well, this looks like a great book. I wonder who brought the digital uh, word chapter in this book, and, and it was myself. <laughs> But other than that, other than this awkward moment that I'm now sharing with you, I'm, um, I uh, want to talk to you today. There's many, of course, so much can be said about work, labor protection, and the digital economy and technological change. And today I'm going to focus on a small part of this debate that has been quite momentous in, uh, in the general debate, in, research, which is the platform economy, labor protection in the platform economy. Now, uh, there's a bunch of names that is used to uh, define the platform economy. People talk about the gig economy, the on-demand economy, some, um, an old-fashioned one is now the sharing economy, but what I'm talking about is basically two main forms of work. The first one is crowd employment or crowd work. So basically work that can be executed online uh, on platforms uh, by workers that uh, are um, sitting in every part of the world. So you are a customer, you are a business that has some work that can be executed online such as stacking photos or um, writing, it's not me, um, uh, writing for instance a, a certain um, a, a certain movie, or for instance, writing short piece of um, short articles, uh, doing auto transcription, all these kind of jobs that can be executed online uh, are actually posted um, every day, millions of these jobs, on platforms such as the Amazon Mechanical Turk or Crowdflower, Clickworker, uh, and many others. The other uh, limb of in the platform economy is what I call work on demand by apps. So basically work for companies such as Uber, Lyft, uh, Fudora, um, TaskRabbit. So basically you mobilize workforce through the use of the internet, but the work is executed locally by a geographically limited uh, workforce in a certain given space. Now, of course, there's so many differences between these two forms of work that uh, one wonders why are we even treating them together. But there are also some similarities that I think are um, actually make useful to uh, have a general discussion on these forms of work. The first one is that, of course, uh, technology for both these forms of work allows for uh, um, immediate match of demand and supply of labor, cutting transaction costs um, very drastically. Uh, they are um, very customer-oriented services. Customers are allowed normally to rate um, the workers on these platforms and to determine whether they will be offered jobs in the future or not, uh, and what kind of jobs they will be offered in the future. So it's quite customer-oriented. There's a lot of flexibility for the customers and the businesses and the platforms, and also for some of the workers. Some of the workers, especially those who work online, report that they are quite happy uh, that they can go online more or less whenever they want, even though we see that this flexibility can also be practically limited. And uh, uh, again, for, for customers, for clients, for businesses, uh, it offers the possibility of access to a pay-as-you-go workers. You only pay for the tiny work or the ride or the delivery that you need. And for the rest of the time, you don't have to worry about anything. The worker doesn't receive any sort of uh, social security or uh, additional protection. And there's no better way to basically summarize this concept uh, than using the words of some of the key actors in, um, in this kind of business. Lucas Beold is one of the um, is the CEO of Crowdflower, one of the major um, crowd work platforms. He says before the internet it was very difficult to hire somebody 
uh, adding work for 10 minutes for you and then fire them when they don't want, they don't want you to do that anymore. Then if you want, you can add them back. And Jeff Bezos, the, um, the owner of Amazon and the founder of the Amazon Mechanical Turk, uh, says, well, with crowd work, with platform work, we actually can have access to humans as a service. So basically, we only use human work when we need it, and we pay only for the tiny amount of time which we need it, and for the rest, we don't have to worry about it. Now, they don't have to worry about it, but as policy uh, people or labor experts, we have to worry about it, of course, because the idea of having humans and using, using humans as a service is quite a problematic one. First of all, if for customers and businesses, it's great to have a workforce that can be mobilized on the mark, on the mark for workers. That means that when they are not working, they are on their own. They, there's no uh, basically um, social protection for them. Uh, there's only the tiny pay that they can get when they are at work. Um, there's a lot of um, dehumanization. We don't even know that some of the work that is executed online is actually executed by humans. The Amazon Mechanical Turk trained itself as being artificial, artificial intelligence. So you think some work is executed by computers, but actually it's either too complicated or too boring for computers to do it. And so it's executed by humans. Um, the flexibility is actually there, but uh, if you want to earn any living wage on this platform, you need to always be on the platform. And in many cases, if you are not constantly on the platform, you lose access to the more meaningful jobs, the better paid jobs. Um, and of course, even if you work online, um, let's say that you work in India, um, one of the biggest uh, segment of the working population of the Amazon Mechanical Turk uh, works uh, from India. Uh, if you work on the Amazon Mechanical Turk, all the customers come from the US, so that means they basically post work when it's night for you. So you have to work at, on social hours if you want to have access to meaningful jobs. So the flexibility is there, but it's also practically limited in many ways. If you want to drive people around the town, you need to be there when people want to go to places. You cannot drive only at night, or you cannot drive whenever you want. If you want to deliver food, you will have to be available at certain times of the day. So the flexibility is there, but we shouldn't overestimate the amount of flexibility work as well. Um, there is, um, as I said, the possibility for customers to rate workers. But there is no way of understanding whether this form of rating uh, can be discriminatory. If I am rating someone poorly because he has a very uh, bad Italian accent, as myself, uh, there's no way of, uh, of detecting that. Uh, workers are normally classified as independent contractors almost invariably. That means that they don't have access to basic labor protection such as the minimum wage. As a matter of fact, the hourly, uh, the, hour, um, the only pay for workers in the Amazon Mechanical Turk is around two US dollars per hour, so two and a half dollars per hour. Um, in many platforms, workers submit the work, and the customers are allowed to retain the work, but refuse payment because they can say we are not satisfied with the work you have provided to us. But in the meantime, you are allowed to retain the work that has been provided, so that can lead to uh, opportunistic behaviors that, and this is a, um, a big concern for some workers in, in, in online classes. Uh, there's a total unilateral way of platforms of dealing with working conditions. They set, um, or they set unilaterally the fees, or they change the way the fees are paid, or they, they allow customers to um, set unilaterally their fees. They change the, um, the working conditions and the terms of payment, and you can only accept or refuse to accede to the platform. But once you accede to the platform, there's no other way for you than to accept any change that comes from uh, the platform. Um, workers can be monitored anywhere, 
uh, either by GPS or if they work online, um, especially when the platforms pay in by hour and customers pay in by hour, uh, some of the platforms take screenshots of the work that uh, people are doing on their laptops to show the clients that during the time they're feeding them, uh, they are actually working there and not checking their Facebook or checking their personal email. So there's a, a, a big deal of monitoring that, again, is almost invisible. We, we rarely, are rarely concerned about this kind of control that is executed by the um, I started to work on this topic when I was an officer for the International Labour Office, so I, um, I also examined the risks that are there for workers regarding fundamental labour rights. And the fundamental labour rights that the International Labour Organization recognizes as universal to be accessible to all workers are freedom association collective bargaining, the right not to be discriminated, not to be discriminated against, the freedom from child labour and freedom for sport labour. And all these uh, set of rights um, can be jeopardized uh, in the platform economy. Freedom of association collective bargaining, if you are an independent contractor in many countries in the world, you are not allowed to join trade unions and to engage in collective bargaining. Because if you do that, you are considered to be a cartel in breach of uh, trade law, of competition law. Um, there is forced labor online. We, of course, we, when we think of online work, we will never think of sweatshops. But actually, in um, in dictatorship, there's people who work in labor camps in the field during the day and online during the night. And there's sweatshops also uh, for children that work online. So. All these risks normally go undetected because the last thing we think when we think of online work and platform work is forced labor and child labor. But actually, there's a, a lot of this phenomena uh, going on that go again undetected. Discrimination is another issue. As a customer, for instance, I am allowed to exclude entire regions of the world from the people that can accede to the jobs that they post online. As a customer, I am allowed to rate the workers, and there's no way of uh, eliminating my implicit or explicit bias uh, that can drive my rating. So there's a risk also of discrimination. And all these risks are enhanced by the fact that in many jurisdictions, you only have access to this fundamental labor protection if you work as an employee. It's in many countries of the world, it's not illegal to have children work as self-employed people. It's not illegal to discriminate against self-employed persons because the labor laws were introduced to protect employees and not self-employed people. So in many cases, these people are not, don't even have access under the national jurisdiction to any sort of remedy because they are excluded from labor protection. Uh, I will go a bit quick to uh, avoid, I, I won't uh, bother you with the clauses because mm, I'm a lawyer but I want to save you from, from this. I only want to show you uh, one, uh, a couple of uh, um, interesting ones. Uh, this one was then changed, but was an original clause from a delivery contract, uh, a good delivery platform in the UK that said yes, once you accede to the platform, you need to tell us when are you going to work, and if you don't show up, we can uh, terminate your contract uh, without any notice. And if you don't show up in a pre-agreed shift, you have to give us a justification, otherwise we will terminate your contract. So this uh, flexibility of working time should be actually called Question. It's true in many cases, but there are also instances in which this is not true at all. There's another clause that was then uh, modified by, um, by the leader after the House of Commons complained about this clause in the UK. And this clause says uh, basically if you sue us, if you claim employment status and sue us, you have to keep us indemnified. So you have to pay us back every compensation that you get out of the court 
and our legal expenses. Now, um, can I ask you to raise your hand? Do you think this clause is valid? Who thinks this clause is valid? Okay, so we have a zero. <laughs> this clause, like, it doesn't, it's not worth the paper on which it's written. But of course, if you are a migrant worker in the UK, and the vast majority of the people who work for Deliveroo uh, in, in the UK are migrant workers who have difficulty in reading in English, you don't know that this clause doesn't work anything, of course. So, there's lots of abusive clauses. Uh, many cases in, uh, in the government, many litigation have occurred on Uber and Lyft. Lyft is the main competitor of Uber in the United States. I guess maybe also in Canada, I don't know. But basically, workers in many parts of the world have challenged the fact that uh, Uber classify them are independent contract. And this, um, this judgment from the court of California, from a district court in California, says basically uh, we cannot accept Uber's claim that it only provides digital services and it doesn't provide a transportation service. And the reason is that Uber actively intervenes in the way that transport is provided. It doesn't merely matches the demanded supply of a, of a job. It goes much beyond that. And interestingly, this same line of thought uh, was followed by the uh, European Court of Justice, so the, the highest court of the European Union, uh, called to determine whether Uber was only a digital provider or a transportation service, uh, focused on the idea that Uber drivers are having control by the platform, and therefore the platform is actively involved in providing the service. Are these people employees or not? Uh, you have various uh, outcomes in different jurisdictions. For instance, in Europe, you have a, um, a judgment in France that says no, Uber drivers are not employees because they can actually decide when and if to work. You can decide whether to accede to the app or not, so you're not an employee. In the UK, uh, the London Employment Tribunal um, didn't say, didn't go as far as saying that uh, Uber drivers are employees, but they were classified by the London Tribunal as workers, which is an intermediate category of dependent contractors in the UK that have access to the minimum wage and to work in time regulation and to the right not to be discriminated against. And the reason why the tribunal reached this conclusion is because they say, well, Uber drivers have no say in the determining uh, the fare. Uh, they have to follow the route that Uber suggests. They have to follow the directions of Uber, and the customers can rate their performance. And if they perform, the, if the drivers perform under a certain threshold, they get kicked out of the platform. So the idea that Uber drivers are a mosaic of small businesses going around London, loosely coordinated by an entity called Uber, is ridiculous. Uber is the provider of the services, and therefore, uh, these workers are entitled to labor protection because they are not small businesses. They are actually workers who need access to fundamental labor rights. Um, but again, this idea of flexibility of working time uh, doesn't regard only Uber. In many cases, platforms were brought to court around uh, Europe and in the US by workers saying, we actually work as employees. We don't have autonomy in how we work. And we should be protected under existing labor laws. And we have various outcomes in some, in some countries, such as France, in Italy, the decisions were negative. They were told, no, actually, you are an independent contractor. In other countries, such as Pakistan and Belgium, um, the courts determined that uh, actually workers have access to labor protections as employees. And why the courts in France and Italy and in the US uh, say the contrary? Because the workers have flexibility of working time. 
They can decide whether to go or not online, more or less, whenever they want. But my question to you today is, do we really have to confine and does it make any sense to restrict the application of labor laws if people have flexible working time? I mean, academics have flexible working times and most of the time they are employees, right? You can have employment without having a fixed schedule. Why so we have to exclude workers that are clearly in need of protection, they don't have any say in that amount how they are paid, they don't have any say in how they provide the service, they can kick out of the platform if the customers are unhappy with them. Why should they be excluded from labor laws? Uh, and can we actually take this flexibility for granted when we don't know if you have a flexible schedule, how the algorithm rates you. If you have a flexible schedule, many works report, you don't get as much jobs as the ones who are constantly there. So people are driven to work constantly to get access to, to, um, to new sheets and to the better paying jobs. So can we take flexibility for granted if we don't know and we don't have transparency in how the algorithms work? Right? I think that we should actually consider this very, very uh, closely. And to finish, uh, I argue that it's not necessary to revolutionize red label law and labor protection to take care of some of the problems that could and, and are originated by the platform economy. Some of the existing tests, such as giving too much attention to flexibility of working time, can be realized without revolutionizing labor law. And even if we don't do that, some fundamental labor rights, such as freedom of association, the right not to be discriminated against, arguably don't have anything to do with employment status. They are universal, they are regarded as human rights in many international treaties and should be accessible by every worker, even if they are self-employed people. And I stop here. Thank you.